To my great regret, I recently watched Jurassic World Dominion. It took two attempts, but I got there. And as you may expect, I didn't like it very much. Nor do I think much of an objective argument can be made to defend it as anything more than cinematic tribe. It had the usual problems of the Jurassic World films and was exceptionally boring to boot. But it's worth noting too that it was also the most overblown Jurassic World film. It constantly name drops grandiose concepts like genetic power, and the man legally considered as a film director Colin Trevorrow seems to believe this was somehow what the film was about, and that it was a true science thriller. It wasn't. So let's briefly explore what actual science thrillers like the novels by Michael Crichton were, and how Dominion unsurprisingly fails to meet this standard. Michael Crichton's first best-selling novel was The Andromeda Strain, a thriller about an extraterrestrial virus and the struggle to contain it. Eighteen pages in and Crichton dabbles into some entry-level science, rattling off various developments in biology and medicine before claiming how there had never been a biological crisis, and that the Andromeda strain was the first. So already we can see how some real-life knowledge is used to directly lay down the groundwork for the novel to take place. But said knowledge also doesn't have to be applied directly. In the novel, there's the wildfire quarantine plant, whose actions fit loosely with the CDC procedures at the time, and was likely based off the NASA Lunar Receiving Laboratory. It's not a one-to-one -one copy, but so long as you understand the why and the how of such places, you can replicate something similar. Understanding the context behind the concepts allows for the appropriate decisions for if they should be included and how. And Crichton often opens his novels with a fictitious foreword, sometimes written like a disclaimer for a real event. A lot of the events of said novels would often be considered something of a crisis if they were to happen in real life, that would very likely receive at least some media attention. In these, Crichton often uses knowledge to build fictitious scientists or discoveries that sound believable to lay the supporting, world-building bedrock for the further science fiction events of the novel. Fundamentally, knowledge of science is actually used in science fiction for a science thriller. As there was a lot of genuine caution at the time of early space explorations of astronauts bringing something back from outer space. Not necessarily an alien, but potential pathogens or organisms. So here we can see how fears current at the time were realised and expanded upon to create Crichton's first big hit. And Andromeda Strain very much sets up the Crichton methodology. Reasonably rapid, pulpy narratives often framed around a mystery, with big blocks of plot-relevant real-world and in-universe science cropping up occasionally, and often being vaguely related to some general fear or recent popular scientific discovery of the time. Jurassic Park is obviously genetic engineering and chaos theory, and despite the film adaptation very much carrying the dinosaur renaissance to the public, it's only really the sequel The Lost World that delves more into the dinosaurs themselves and their suggested behaviour and ecology outside of just plot obstacles. Various scientists like the eminent mammalogist George Schawler are mentioned. Sarah Harding effectively fulfils the role Hans Crook did in discovering the more accurate nature of spotted hyenas as predators. And the dinosaurs are all eventually succumbing to dino scrapey as a result of cost-cutting at the original Jurassic Park facilities. Congo very much incorporates a lot of the buzz around Amy the sign-languaging gorilla at the time, with the plot essentially being all the Silicon Valley nerdlingers rushing to pillage the Congo of its boron-laden Type 2B diamonds for all their assorted computer tech of the future. There's also some murderous gorilla chimp hybrids. And combining all that together doesn't sound like a world beater, but all in all it's still a pretty fun read. This is not to say that such usage of science stops it being science fiction, nor that all of the fiction is especially plausible even in context. Jurassic Park's cloning methods sound plausible when you're eight, and then fall apart with any real scrutiny. Prey is one of Crichton's most enjoyable narratives, but one of the most shaky with the science of the actual nanotech in it for sure. But then, these are still works of fiction delivering stories, not academic papers. Prey's methodology of self-replicating nanobots is flawed to say the least, but built on real concerns. Grey Goo scenarios were discussed by scientists from the beginning, and such technology has its own version of the Geneva Convention to prevent a prey ever happening. How much actual science does a science thriller need? 
and how accurate does it have to be? And outside of literally some, there's probably no real answer here. Science thriller is a relatively small and poorly defined genre. There are a lot of novels that likely pertain to a Crichton-esque methodology, but with completely fictitious science. So do they count if they don't have any real-world backing? If someone wrote a novel containing dinosaurs that they just wanted to be as accurate as they could manage with up-to-date published discoveries, but with scientific developments outside of that having no involvement in plot or themes, would that still count despite pretty active scientific involvement? So maybe we can set the loose guideline that science thriller has to actively involve science and its developments into its overarching narrative theme, and has to reference at least a certain number of relevant published texts or observed phenomena. And this guideline is still loose, that should be stressed. It is still only something suggested by me right now, and it's probably still something of a grey area. Last month I greatly enjoyed reading Max Brooks's Devolution, a novel featuring a little Silicon Valley eco-village cut off from civilization by the eruption of Mount Rainier, when a troop of starving Sasquatch arrive and realize humans are made out of meat. If you've already read his World War Z, you don't need further convincing, but goofy as it may sound initially, it was a fantastic read, and is certainly the closest thing to a new Michael Crichton novel, except with better characters and it did make me wonder whether it could be considered a science thriller. The book is meticulously researched, with the Sasquatches heavily based off studies of primate behaviour, and all the plot-relevant smart home technology being pretty up to scratch as well. But the overall narrative doesn't really involve a current scientific development, although it could be argued that the formal discovery of Sasquatches as a species would be and much of the Sasquatch behaviour that drives the story is based on actual animal behaviour, so it's pretty hard to call. Is a new scientific development really needed, or will sufficient science baked into the plot be sufficient? Such grey areas are also pretty common in the discussion of science fiction. It could also be worth noting, as others have said, that thriller is often just a term for horror for people who think horror is too lowbrow. So if we expand it to science horror then it does feel right that the science should be part of what creates the horror aspect. Then there's the loose classifications of hard versus soft sci-fi, and even then people can't make their minds up if it's to delineate the hard and soft sciences, or the level of scientific rigour put into the novels. Similarly, some hard sci-fi novels still have science that's quite shaky to say the least, and then you have Larry Niven, who rewrote his own canon when Nerdling has pointed out that his super high-tech space-age cyber planet wouldn't work. So even here it's hard to conclude just how the science in a science thriller should be constructed, but the final word can be that actual, real science should be included full stop, to inform the events of the story or its setting in some way. It's worth noting too, it's a lot harder to make a science thriller film than novel. You can easily integrate big blocks of text from actual papers or scientist characters, and not have them derail things too badly. But having a character go on a monologue saying this on screen probably would. But I think Jurassic Park still achieves it relatively well, with various dinosaur scenes directly referencing how incorrect old beliefs were, and bringing in the new ones. Bird-dinosaur relations are repeatedly stressed, and in the initial Brachiosaurus scene, the characters can clearly be heard saying how it's a warm-blooded active animal, not dependent on water to support its weight. So how well does Dominion do at fulfilling both of the criteria? And yet it fails at both. Now, some may try to argue that Dominion tries to incorporate science into its narrative with the whole locust plot, but really does it? The film tries to use the words genetic power, with no establishing baseline scenes of what this actually is or how it's affecting the world right now. Malcolm gives a vague and questionable lecture on how it can go wrong, but really it's still just meaningless buzzwords. And it's just the locusts, which come out of nowhere, function as an excuse to introduce bias in bad and get the gang back together for it and then get hand-waved with a little virus with not much in between. There's some weird dialogue about how biocin are apparently fine with millions dying of starvation, despite the fact that it'd surely reduce the financial gains from controlling the global food supply, if there's significantly less people who need food. And the whole locust angle gets progressively weirder and dumber through the film, until it sounds like they're literally biocin's plan to destroy the world for no real reason. 
the words global ecological collapse are used. It feels a lot like some Saturday morning cartoon villain twirling his moustache as he says how he'll take over the world. Why? Dodgson is presumably a billionaire already, with a close monopoly on dinosaurs and a lot of GM tech already. What is he gaining by taking over the world that he doesn't have already? And then despite all of this, apparently the locusts are actually still just a side project, unimportant compared to the dinosaurs and for some reason Maisie, despite the fact that cloning humans is really more of a moral quandary and far from a scientific one. And from what we see, everyone else at Biosyn seems pretty legit, and it's just Dodgson being the nutcase. Just as one of the best showcases of his failure to understand Jurassic Park is his Welcome to Jurassic World scene, where he seems to think a morass of CGI buildings that wouldn't even be interesting to look at if they were real, carries the same weight as the two paleontologists and indeed the audience, seeing an especially magnificent dinosaur for the first time in millennia, so too is all of Dominion a showcase of his failure to understand Crichton. He thinks parroting vaguely scientific sounding terms is the same thing as including actual science in the framework of the story, and it's really not, unsurprisingly. Crichton wouldn't have wrote this unless he had some species or real backing to go off, and if it wasn't present, he'd have found a different story to tell. Trevorrow just tries to rehash the old what-if-genetic-engineering-bad from the very first novel and first film and most films in the story since. We've already done that, had it done well, and unsurprisingly, Trevorrow doesn't do it well. It's worth noting in passing too, the new dinosaurs are also terrible. Between the weird Giganotazilla, the Moros Intrepidus Manlet, and the plane destroying Quetzalcoatlus, it's all just a crappy mash of hideous inaccuracy that a few sparse feathers aren't enough to cover up. Yeah, those genetically accurate dinosaurs of yours really came through, hey Colin? At the end of the day, it does seem you can't brute force or shortcut a good science thriller. I'm sure Brasati did what they could. But ultimately, you need an author with some genuine interest or understanding of the broader themes of which branch of science they want their film to be about. It takes actual research, and Trevorrow couldn't even do that for the only aspects of the films he seems to cling to, the dinosaurs. And as I said in my other Jurassic video, it's really worth noting it's not like we're short of talking points here. The past decade has probably had animals, wild, captive, and domestic, at the forefront of a lot of news regarding their treatment at human hands, interactions with inhabited areas and scientific discoveries, the increasing habitat encroachment of developing areas and the human-wildlife conflict that comes with it, the ongoing saga of wolves in Yellowstone, Cecil the Lion, trophy hunting in general, Blackfish, Travis the Chimp, poaching and everything surrounding it, the inherent wealth disparity of ecotourism, Tiger King, militant animal rights groups, the actual bloody reality of amber mining, invasive species, covid, climate change. Honestly, take your pick of what you could say with this franchise. And what did we get? Jokonotosaurus and Cretaceous era DNA locusts. Fantastic. It's worth noting too, giant and slash or insect swarms aren't so far-fetched. After all, actual locust species will swarm and cause crop damage. And Africanized or killer bees are a genuine thing too. Africanized honeybees themselves are just hybrids caused by human intervention, much like most of the InGen stock. The failure comes in the aforementioned execution in the film, but also the writing. There's no species or genus of Cretaceous locust mentioned, no specification about the actual traits they selected for from it, or what benefits the Cretaceous DNA actually brings, or why it was necessary to add it to the locusts in the first place. Clearly, to Trevorrow, saying vaguely sciencey sounding buzzwords like DNA and using actual science are exactly the same thing. There's no commentary or reference or real involvement, it's just a bad excuse to stuff more in. All of this is also just made a lot worse by how Trevorrow seems to talk about his own films, his talk about how he wanted a film about genetic power when Trevorrow clearly has no clue about what that is, other than the usual D-list supervillain plot of world domination, nor any real look at the consequences that happen as a result of it in his own film. The locusts get one zero impact crop guzzling scene for setup, and that's the sum total of our consequences of genetic power. And even then they're hardly a consequence when they may or may not have been intended. The film seems unable to make up its mind on that. 
There's also, I specifically did something different than the other films to change the DNA of the franchise. And I suppose completely obliterating the cinematic quality of said franchise can be considered doing something different. Well, prior to 2015 it might have been. Then there's of course his comment about how it took two movies to earn this one. And just what does that mean exactly? Trevorrow loves such lofty, pretentious comments about his films when they're literally below B-movie schlock. At least B-movie schlock knows what it is, and it's there purely to entertain on a basic spectacle level. It isn't obsessed with trying to be deep from a man who has no idea how to write real depth. Then there's the Jason Bourne and James Bond comment, and the decision to make it part spy movie. Because truly the most repeated comment about Jurassic Park was, I just wish it was a little bit more like Goldfinger. Perhaps the nadir of these, most often repeated in paleo circles that's worthy of a mention, is indeed the Giganotosaurus being the Joker. And what do you even say to this? Perhaps the weird contrast between how asinine making such a point is, with the fact it barely did anything in the film? And it really is kind of sad seeing how far a franchise spawned from the original Jurassic Park has fallen. After watching this, and when you have the time and patience, I do recommend watching the original Jurassic Park, followed by any of the Jurassic World films. I think quite a lot have forgotten just how good it once was. How tight the writing is, how good the dialogue is, how good the practical effects are, how it treats the dinosaurs. I think the intentional inclusion of the original actors to try and create some connection between the older films and the World series, and claiming Dominion as the epic conclusion planned all along, has gaslit many into thinking there isn't this vast chasm of quality between them. It really is night and day between the blandness of the characters, the stunted writing, and the weird, constant cartoonish attempts to try and make the dinosaurs heroic or evil pseudo-human characters, culminating in the ultimate cringe of I made a promise to a raptor. For good writing in this department, David Armsby's Dinosauria on YouTube provides great short stories with personal dinosaur characters that still feel and act like actual animals. All of this isn't just for sniping at Trevorrow, fun as that is, but to show that as a filmmaker, Trevorrow never progresses past the basic understanding of what ingredients are needed for quality. He's capable of realising that the first film was applauded by many, had dinosaurs, and had the original cast. But he doesn't understand that the good writing was the oven in which these ingredients were baked in. And so rather than delivering a well-made cake, he delivers a disgusting charcuterie board of raw eggs and flour, thinking it's the same thing. And then he tops it all with his homemade icing of sociopath dinosaurs and wannabe Jason Bourne films. Clearly he likes the latter so I imagine in his mind it'd be an ideal combination. But to end on some positivity, the worst does now seem to be behind us. Trevorrow has left the franchise for good, and whilst I don't have much hope for the fourth and fifth films in the instalment, there is about a 7 or 8% chance it could be good. I wasn't willing to give House of the Dragon the time of the day after season 8, until I was pestered into doing so, and I've rarely been happier to be wrong. But more importantly, Universal's shackles do seem to be broken. 65 does look like crap, but importantly it is a big budget Hollywood blockbuster not in the Jurassic Park franchise. Between it, documentaries and animation, Universal no longer owns dinosaurs anymore. And if anyone can make dinosaur films again, maybe we'll finally get a good one again. Thanks for watching. And as ever, a huge thanks to top patron Big Al for their most generous support of the channel, as well as Kay Sandum, Erin Garsteini, Venomenon, Evilly, Howleth, Archazor Queen, and Bazugazu Bakuhatsu Bakumatsu, for their continuing support of the channel as well. If this is your first video of mine, for other videos you may like if you watched all of this one, I have one that more directly discusses the films of Jurassic Park and Jurassic World, and their role in dinosaur education in the public eye. There's other paleo content like videos on Prehistoric Planet and the Walking With series, and plenty of speculative ecology on Monster Hunter and other creatures too. Hopefully there'll be something to keep you coming back.